Again, good morning, everyone. I'm glad that you could be here on this chilly Sunday. Uh, you made it to church, though. It's nice and warm in here, and I've got great news for you. Uh, this is not prophetic. You can find this in the weather app, but it's supposed to be a lot warmer next week. So warm weather is coming. It's supposed to be like high 40s. It might even hit 50, so praise the Lord, right? When, when it's January in Ohio, we just have to praise God for the small things, just to be thankful for the small things. But we are in the middle of a, of a new vision series here to start the year called Write the Vision. <clears throat> Write the Vision. We have been looking through Habakkuk. We started in chapter 1 last week. We're going to look at the beginning of chapter 2 today. If you remember the story, God, it, there's a dialogue between Habakkuk and God. And God is giving Habakkuk a vision for him and the country of Israel. Because right now, the nation of Israel, it, it, they're struggling with injustice and idolatry. And last week, we looked at the first chapter of Habakkuk, and, and Habakkuk is bringing these complaints, these frustrations to God. Did anyone enjoy the airing of grievances last week? Did you enjoy that, that message? Maybe that Seinfeld reference really did it for you. Um, but we talked about, you know, when we go through difficult times, when we go through struggles, we should submit them first to God. You can air those grievances out to your friends and to other people. You can talk about God, but nothing is more powerful than when we talk to God. Amen. When we lift up our problems to God, He is the one that can provide true and eternal change. Amen. And so Habakkuk has brought his frustrations, and his last complaint actually ends the first verse of chapter 2. So that's where we closed last week. We said, Habakkuk said, I will station myself at my post. And I'm going to listen for what you will say to me. And lastly, he says, what I will answer concerning my complaint. I think it's funny because a lot of times when we ask somebody to answer, we're asking for, he was asking for God's answer. But Habakkuk says, for what I will answer concerning my complaint. Because Habakkuk knew while I'm frustrated with God, while things are not going the way that I want them to, if anyone is wrong in a situation between God and myself, it's me. I'm wrong. Right. It's not God. Yeah. God's not wrong. I am wrong. Yeah. And so Habakkuk knew how to posture himself to hear from the Lord. So we're going to continue in this story in Habakkuk chapter 2. If you've got your Bible, you can turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. If not, don't worry. We have it on the screens. And if you're one of those people that love to have a sermon outline. You can go onto the Church Center app, scroll to the bottom and find our outline, or you can go on the YouVersion Bible app and find the outline. Here we are, Habakkuk chapter 2, starting with verse 2. This is what God answers. It says, The Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. So he may run who reads it. Write the vision. I want you to know that God has a vision for your life. Let's say it again. God has a vision for your life. Yeah. For your life, specifically. He's got a plan for you. Last week we talked about when we're trying to hear from God, when we're seeking God, we're crying out to Him, we're looking for Him, we're waiting for Him, and now what happens? When we believe we've heard from God. How do we take God's vision and carry it on with us? Today's message is called From Vision to Venture. I want to be a little bit practical today. I hope that's okay. How do we take what God has spoken over us and how do we go and live that out? And so from vision to venture, because it's not enough for God to give us a vision. We have to steward that vision. We are responsible for what God gives us. So what are the steps we have to take when God gives us vision? The first one is very simple. And we're diving right into the, the first point. Number one, the first thing to do is write it down. Write it down. The first thing that the Lord answers him, he says, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets. We need to write down what God is asking us to do. Because when God speaks to us, we need to be prepared to record it. You know, when you sense, uh, when inspiration kicks in, creativity 
you know, what, imagination, whatever it is, when that kicks in, you have to be ready to write it down. Are there any writers in the room? I know we had some in first service. If, if you're a writer and a, an idea comes, you need to capture that moment. You can't al allow that to waste away and go away. For me, over the years, occasionally I'll write songs. And, and I'm a melody person. There's a lot of times when writing songs, are you a melody person or you're a lyrics person? So a lot of times I'll hear a melody, and it's never at a convenient time, you know? You're like, I'm in a meeting, or I've just gone to bed, and, and I feel like maybe God is dropping out. I, I just want to steward that. And so I'm like, I can't leave this meeting right now. I don't want to get out of bed right now. I will record it later. What happens when I try to go record it later? I forget it. It's gone. We have to steward what God has given us. Write down the vision. I mean, we all have phones at our disposal at pretty much any time. Right. And with phones, there are traps, right? There are distractions that come with phones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But think about it. With a phone now, we have the ability to at any time take a photo, record audio, write something down right away. Mm -hmm. one, one of my friends, I don't think Mark is here, but if, if he is, raise your hand. Um, Mark Harrington is one of the OGs. He will actually take a notepad with him wherever he goes. So if I go get coffee with Mark and we're talking and he wants to take notes, he will whip out his notepad and pencil and start <coughs> taking notes. Pastor Dennis is very much like that as well, actually. He, he's got his pen and his paper. He's ready to take notes on things. Because we cannot afford to forget what God is asking us to do. When, when vision happens, Whatever it is, we have to be ready to write it down and record it. I encourage you, write down the vision, write down your yearly goals, your monthly goals, your grocery list, whatever it is that you need to remember, write it down because that automatically increases the likelihood of you doing that. I found an article on LinkedIn, and of course it has to be true because it's on the internet, but it says that research shows that when you write down goals, you are 42% more likely to achieve them than those who don't. There's automatically an increase. If you want a way to increase the likelihood of you achieving a goal, just start by writing it down. Because what happens when you write it down? First of all, it helps you to clarify what your goal is. A lot of times God gives us stuff and it's all up here. It's kind of all you know, theoretical. Like, I think it's something like this. God wants me to do this. When you write it down, you have to clarify it. You have to make it very clear. When you write it down, it also makes you accountable. Because you said, well, I wrote it down. I said I was going to do it. I better go do it now. And it also helps you to simply remember. We can all be very forgetful. It's easy to forget things. Writing it down. You know, when we were choosing a name for this church, we were, we were struggling to figure out what should be the name of this church here, because that was something we didn't want to just flippantly choose a name, right? There's all kinds of names out there. Any name that you can think of, it's probably a church out there somewhere in the world, I'm sure. But we were thinking about it, and one night I was exhausted. I'm like, I am done thinking through names of this church. Um, and, and so I decided I'm just going to bed. I'll think about this more tomorrow. And I'm not sure what happens to you when you try to sleep at night, but there are times when my brain simply will not allow me to go to sleep, right? Yeah. It, it'll say things to you like, let's think through all the plans for tomorrow you have before bed. I'm like, no, no, not right now. Like, I, I need to go to bed. They're like, let's talk about all your fears and worries. Let's rehash those four things that you did wrong today. Like, no, I don't want to do that right now. Can I please go to sleep? That last email you sent had no attachment to it, just so you know that. Just so you know. It's like all these things, right? And as I was going to bed, I simply, I simply thought of or heard of or whatever you want to put there, the gather. I said, the gather. I didn't fall in love with it right away, if I can be honest with you. But I said, okay, I will write it down so I don't forget. I'll put it in my notes. And sure enough, the next day I look at my notes, and there's the gather. I continue to think about it, pray about it, talk to other people about it. And spoiler alert, that's what ended up being the name of the church, if you didn't know, the gathering. I want to remind you that when you write things down, you are more likely to achieve them. Writing them down. One, one last thing on writing it down. Um, to start this year, we talked a lot about praying, fasting, seeking God to start this year. 
One part of those disciplines I have not talked about that I hope you've been still focusing on is reading the Bible. How have you been doing to start the year reading the Bible? Doing okay? If not, it's okay. Guess what? There is no better day to start than today. If you struggled in the beginning of the year, start right now. Nothing's stopping you. Not as many amens on that, but it's true. It's the right thing to say. And when I talk about the Bible and receiving it, storing it in your mind, in your brain, in your heart, we at Essentials talked about this last week. We recommend a version of journaling the Bible that's called SOAP. Has anyone heard the acronym of SOAP, right? I'll walk you through it. SOAP means, first one is S, Scripture. So within that chapter maybe that you read, what is a specific scripture that really stood out to you? Write that one down. Type it into your notes, whatever. Next thing, O, observation. What did you observe from what you read? What in that scripture did you observe that, that God point out to you? And then the A, application. It's great that you observe something, but now how are you going to apply it to your life? How will your life change based on what the Word of God spoke to you? And then lastly, prayer. Take a minute to pray over that scripture. God, you spoke to me in the story of Abraham, how he was faithful throughout that. Help me to be faithful just like he was. You know, whatever it is that God is speaking to you, it's a great way to write it down, to remember what God is speaking to you as you read through the Bible. I'll say for me, it's on my phone. I've got an app, a, a note that's called SOAP. And for me, some of the best messages, in my opinion, that I write come from my personal devotional time with God. Because I think if God is speaking to me through this, maybe I can communicate this well to you. Because what? Because I wrote it down. He said, write it down and make it clear. Make it plain so you can run with it once you read it. It's important to make our vision clear. And so that's why we at the, at the church, when we started the gathering, we didn't just start the gathering. We said, we are the gathering, and this is a place for you to belong, believe, and become. We made it clear, what is the vision here at the gathering? We said you can belong to a church that loves you. That, that means that if you have questions or doubts, you belong here. If you've had church hurt somewhere else, guess what? You belong here. If you've messed up in your life, join the club. You belong here. That's right. And not only do you belong here, but now we're going to grow together in our belief of God. That's right. We're going to grow in, in what the Bible tells us. We're going to grow together. And I love how a, a, serv a, a pastor put it this week. I was listening to his podcast, and he literally said, belong to believe. He was talking about the disciples of Jesus did you know, I'm going on a rabbit trail, but just follow me for a second. Did you know that before the disciples knew who Jesus was, knew that he was the Son of God, that he was a Savior, Jesus said, follow me. Come with me. You can belong with me. And before they believed in him, they followed and they belonged with him. I believe that's a very important model that we see in the Bible. Belong to believe. And then lastly, I want you to become. I want you to become who God has created you to be. And that's, first of all, universal. We are all becoming who God has created us to be, right? We're all becoming more and more like Jesus. That's the goal. Yeah. But you also have a specific plan. To become who God has created you to be, the best husband or mom or engineer or artist or writer or whoever God has called you to be. To belong, believe, and become. I hope you're clear on that vision for the gathering. I hope that's something that you can latch onto. It's why we say over and over again so that there's no mission drift here at the gathering. We continue to remember why we exist as a church, for people to belong, believe, and become. And that way, when you know the vision, ministry is not just for me or for Scott. Ministry is us together knowing my mission is for people here to belong, believe, and become. And just like it says in Habakkuk, they can run with it. Amen. You can run with the ministry because you know our purpose. Yeah. Write it down. You understand what I'm saying? You get it? Write it down? Good? Yeah. I can move on to the second point? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. The more you preach back to me, the shorter this goes. So. <laughs> So after God tells Habakkuk to write down the vision, make it plain, look at what he says next in verse 3. 
He says, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. So we know we're supposed to write down the vision, run with it, but we also need to know that there are some things that are going to take time. Sometimes we have to wait on the vision. Number two is wait for it. Somebody say wait for it. Wait for it. If there's any MASH fans in the room, you know what that's from. Some of you are looking at me, though, because I've said wait for it, and you're, you're looking like you want to fight me, because this is two Sundays in a row where one of my points is talking about waiting. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at God. He said it. I'm just telling you what he said. And sometimes we have to wait on the vision. But I want to clarify what waiting means here, because waiting... Last week, we talked about truly sitting down before God, kneeling before him, and crying out and waiting. But this wait here, it can also translate to mean to long for. And when we write down the vision and God has a plan, we have to have expectation and continue to follow God in obedience as we wait. Waiting doesn't mean just stop everything that you're doing. You have to continue to grow as a person. And if there's a roadblock in front of you, there might be a reason that the timing is not quite right. If the job has not opened up yet, that doesn't mean you should just stop and you should quit your job. No, continue to gain experience. Prepare yourself for when the right time comes. If, If you haven't yet found Mr. Right or Mrs. Right for your life, that doesn't mean you should stop growing as a person. Please continue to grow in emotional maturity and and, and personal maturity and and grow as a person, as a human being. Be prepared, be a godly man or woman, so that when that person comes into your life, you're ready to go. There are times to get before God to sit and wait, and there are times that he gives us vision to write, and then we have to wait because what does God say about the vision? He says it awaits its appointed time. Appointed time. Meaning someone has chosen that time. Who's appointed the time? God. It's not a trick question. God has appointed the time. That means it's not random. It's not some random amount of time until it's ready. God has appointed time for things to happen in your life. And what happens when it's appointed and you're not ready? And you can miss out on what God wants to do. I think about this, this story. There was a There's a documentary, a a director who was filming directories, uh, directories, documentaries uh, on what God was doing around the world. I I don't remember his name, but I know one of the movies is Father of Lights. And so he he was capturing stories all around the world, miracles, things that God was doing. And one time he shared in a QA and a how he had a conversation with God. And he said to God, God, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to capture these films and and send them out to the world. Thank you for choosing me. And God said to him, he said, you weren't my first choice. (laughs) Ouch, yes, that hurts. He said there were three or four people before you, but none of them were ready and they said no, and so I chose you and you said yes, and you were obedient and ready to follow me. Obedience trumps skill any day. And we have to accomplish what he sets out. He prepares something for you and me to do. And we have to be ready to run with it in the appointed time because his word does not fail. In that verse where it says it does not lie, what it means is he doesn't fail. God's plans will not be delayed. They will not be thwarted. They will not be prevented. If it's God's vision, it will take place. Nothing can stop it. God will accomplish his vision and his mission. If you're not willing to do it, he will find someone who is willing. He will find a person to create or to write that content. He will find someone to witness to those people in your workplace if it's not you. I hope it's you. God wants it to be you. But his will will be done. He will find people to accomplish his will. And God tells him back, and he says to write it down, and then he says to wait for it. I want to remind you that Habakkuk, he's he's upset right now because he's been crying out to God and God will not hear his 
His cry is what he says. There's injustice, there's idolatry in the land, and God says, I'm doing a work, Habakkuk. You can't see it because it's not being done here in Israel. It's actually being done in the Babylonians. And Habakkuk says, how can you use the Babylonians? They're way worse than us. They are cruel. They are evil. But God was using them to teach the Israelites a lesson. And here God says, I have a vision for how Israel will recover. You need to write it down so that it's recorded, it will be a permanent sign of how your God loves you and it is looking out for you and it will not be delayed. And then, this is what God says. Read verse 4. This is what God is saying about the Babylonians. He said, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It's not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by faith. God says, I, I know what you're saying about Babylon, Habakkuk. I understand. I know that they're evil. I'm aware that they are unrighteous. And if you want to survive this time of trouble, as the Babylonians come and take over, you're going to have to live by faith. Amen. The reason the Babylonians will fall eventually is because they are trusting in themselves and their own ability. And I want to encourage you, when God gives you vision and you're taking action, you've got to write it down. You've got to wait for it. And lastly, number three, you have to be ready to protect it. Protect what God has given you. Because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he is going to tempt you to trust in your own abilities. Amen. Sometimes the worst enemy of ourselves is ourselves. That's right. I, I believe there's a real enemy out there in the world. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes we're like, God, you need to protect me out here while I'm driving. These people, the devil is trying to attack my car. No, you're a bad driver. And you need to pay attention. Just be honest. Can you be honest sometimes, right? Yes, there are, there are forces at work in this world, but sometimes we bring these things on ourselves. And we allow pride to puff up in our heart and to choke out what God wants to do with his dreams and his visions. Look again at that verse 4. It says, his soul is puffed up. God is talking about the nation of Babylon. That they're puffed up with pride. Pride is that temptation to trust yourself instead of trusting God. And pride has been an issue in this world since the very beginning of time. You go back to the Bible, you look at the story of Cain and Abel. The reason Cain killed his brother is because Abel brought a good offering before the Lord. And in that comparison, that pride that took a hit for Cain, he got angry and wanted to kill his brother. You think about the, the people that were building the Tower of Babel. They wanted to reach the sky. They wanted to be their own gods because of pride. You think about Saul the king. God had a plan for Saul. God anointed Saul as king. But as the years went by, Saul began to trust in his own abilities. He didn't like to hear that David had killed more Philistines than he had. And pride took away, removed the anointing. It got so bad that the Bible says God regretted that he made Saul king because of pride. And friends, we can be proud, prideful about a lot of things. The Babylonians, they were prideful in their own strength, their military strength. They were trusting in themselves and in nothing else. Pride tells you that you know what's right, and no one else should tell you how to live your life. No one else has the right to speak into my life. And pride can be found in a lot of things. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are or how poor you are. You can be prideful. You can say, I've got all these things, I'm so rich, I've got so much to be proud of. Or you can be a person that says, I've got nothing, and I'm still existing, I'm still surviving and thriving, because I don't need all that stuff. Pride is there either way. Amen. You can have every skill you can imagine and be proud of all the skill and say, look at all the things I can accomplish. I can do all these things because I have a skill. Or you can have no skill. You, you're like, I, I don't need that skill. I'm a self-made person. I don't need that. There's pride either way. Pride does not show favoritism. It attacks each person. And God says that your soul, I love how he says it here. 
He says Babylon's problem is their soul is not right because of the pride. The reason that our soul is not right because of pride is because pride wants us to receive glory. And you and I as human beings, we were not created to receive glory. We were always meant to give glory. The Bible says we were created to worship God. But what happens when we twist those things is that we allow pride to enter into our hearts. It would happen, it's what happened at the beginning of time of Lucifer. Did you know he was a worship leader, an angel, before he became the devil? He was kicked out of heaven because he wanted more power. Pride always tries to get us to focus on who we are, what we have, receiving glory. But God gives us the remedy for that. He says their soul is not right, they're contorted, they're messed up, but the righteous shall live by faith. Amen. You want to know how to counter that in your life? It's by living by faith. And that phrase became so powerful in the word of God in the Old Testament that it actually got brought back up three times in the New Testament. Did you know that? that? That phrase, the righteous shall live by faith, was quoted three times in the New Testament. I know what you're asking. Where is it? I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you where it's at. I'm going to show you all three times. We're going to look through it very quickly. Paul said it first in Romans chapter 1. Do you remember in verse 16, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This version highlights faith. Faith not just to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior at salvation. That's important. But it says from faith to faith. Meaning we need faith at that moment where we decide that Jesus is Lord of our life. But it also takes faith to daily live out in righteousness. We can't do it apart from faith. Faith's not a one-time decision. It's a daily choice to choose to trust God. So Paul says it here in Romans, and then he says it a second time in Galatians. Look with me at Galatians 3.10. He says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now, it is evident that not, no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. This time, when, when Paul is focusing on it, he's focusing on righteousness. He's focusing on how can we be justified, and he's explaining to them that it's no longer about the law. It's not about a list of do's and don'ts. Righteousness does not come from how you live out those laws. It's by living by faith. Right. So in Romans, he's talking, he's emphasizing the point of faith. In Galatians, he's emphasizing the point of righteous. Now let's look at the very last time that is mentioned in the New Testament. In Hebrews 10.35, the author says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. What is the author of Hebrews focusing on here? He's focusing on the live portion of that phrase. He says, endurance. You have need of endurance. The righteous shall live by faith. If you want endurance to daily live this life for you and to live it to the fullness, the abundance that God has provided for you, that is only found in a, being a righteous person that chooses to live by faith. <coughs> I think it's so important that that phrase, the righteous shall live by faith, for us to remember that, that, that's why in the New Testament, each time, it's mentioned three different times, repeated, and in each different part of the Bible, it focuses on a different part of that phrase. The righteous in Galatians shall live by endurance in Hebrews. 
by faith in Romans 1. Because pride is a dangerous place to be. Can I say that pride brings out an ugly side of us? Where we want it to be all about ourselves. Boasting in what we can do. But if we want to continue on in the vision that God has for us, we have to protect ourselves and not allow pride to build up within us. Amen. The righteous live by faith. There's a reason that the Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud because they believe they don't need God. They don't need anyone to tell them how to live their life. God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. The proud are resistant because they don't think they need God, and they think they are the reason for their success instead of the goodness of God. And I want to encourage you in every part of your life to continue to remember that it's only faith in God that brings the blessing of God. It's only faith in God. My business is not succeeding because of me. It's because of the goodness of God. My children are growing to become godly men and women, not because I'm some perfect parent, but because of the goodness of God. Amen. Faith in God is what honors God. The Bible says it's what pleases. You cannot please God without faith. I encourage you, write down some of the ways in which his goodness has been around you to remind you it's not because of you. It's to strip you of that pride in yourself and to bless the Lord instead. The soul of the Babylonians were contorted and they were puffed up because they had pride in themselves. There's a lot of pride in our world. I'll say there's a lot of pride in the music industry. <laughs> and I'll give you a heads up. I think where we're going to head here soon, because Habakkuk chapter 3 is really a hymn. It's praise to God. I think we're going to head into a little bit of a worship series here soon. I feel like that's where, where God is leading us in. As you can tell, we haven't finished chapter 2, but we'll get there here soon. But there can be temptation of pride in music. And not just in the secular music industry. Hopefully that's, that's a given. But can I be honest? There, there is the temptation of pride in worship music. It can be very easy to think about how great you are, your ability to sing or to play an instrument. And worship music is... Always trying to lay down my pride and, and give glory to God. I hope that you can sense in this room that the gathering is a firm believer in being people that worship God Amen. with our whole heart. That there's a passion here. But if I could share a little bit from, from my story, I was a worship pastor before the gathering. And I can tell you that pride is absolutely a temptation in worship music. Just like it is anywhere. And it's very important to, to remain humble and, and trusting in God and give him glory. And so years ago, I began to write songs. I felt like God was giving me a vision to write songs and, and write an album. So I wrote songs. I wrote down the titles of the songs, did all those things. And God opened up a door to go and record with a producer an album. And the goal was for it to come out about six months later. We went and recorded it in September of 2016. I don't know what your history is in music production, but, you know, six months or so is normal. We began to get excited about it. We were starting momentum. I think we took out, like, an ad at a church conference. We're like, it's coming in spring of 20, uh, 2017. Like, get ready. This album's coming. And once I left and... I finished my part of recording. They had to finish up a couple things. They were closing up some songs. And I was emailing them, obviously really excited to hear, like, hey, how's it going? Can't wait to hear more. What's the report? Radio silence. Mm -hmm. oh. Goes like this for weeks, months. At the church, people are like, hey, how's the album coming along? I'm like, hey, I don't know. Good, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. <clears throat> weeks and months go on, and finally, finally, I get a response from the studio, and, and long story short, they have run into a situation with a lawsuit of an artist that was uh, suing them for issues. I'm not going to get into all that because it's not important. If you want to talk to me later, I can tell you all the, the, the speak. But, um, but basically, they were having to shut down music production for that time and focus on this lawsuit. I'm like, okay, that would have been nice to know a couple months ago, but I appreciate you telling me that now. 
And in that waiting time, I wish I could say that I used that time wisely, but I'm, I'm telling you the story because I hope you can learn from my example. And I struggled in that waiting season. I struggled to give that to God. I had sleepless nights like, God, I thought you gave this to me. I thought this was your plan, and now I'm stuck here. And people are asking me questions, and I've got nothing to tell them, and I thought this was you. What happened? What did I miss? Felt like there's no answer. And if I could go back in that time, there was a, a, I was talking to a worship pastor at one point, and he said, hey, God does not waste a season. So continue to press in with what God has. I wish I could have, I wish I could have continued to write songs during that time, but it stopped me. I was too upset. I was too frustrated. If I could go back, that's what I would do. And, and I, I believe that God's timing is perfect. I don't know why he does everything the way that he does. Yeah. Eventually that album came out in March of 2018, about 18 months after we recorded it. And I don't know why God did what he did, but I'm just guessing. Maybe I wasn't ready for it to come out. Maybe if it had come out in my timing with the momentum that I thought, maybe my head would have begun to get a little big, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I would have got prideful of what I had accomplished, what I had done, all these fallacies. I don't know why God did it the way he did, but I know it worked out for my best. I hope that it kept me humble to know this isn't about me, this is about glorifying God with this music. Yeah. And the ability that because it came out later, it gave us the ability to later write songs that would come out at the beginning of 2022. And there was a smaller gap between those two albums, Refuge and Every Battle. I'll just shamelessly tell you, I'll plug the albums. Because I believe in the music. Because I believe that they can bless you and they bless me and others and have an impact. But so often when we focus on our own timetable, that we focus, that it becomes our plan, our vision, and pride begins to well up, and it makes us not right within ourselves. It puffs us up. It makes our soul not right, like God says there to Habakkuk. Would you stand to your feet as we close, and Alex come and play as we close? I'm not going to draw this out. I just want to take a minute to pray for each and every one of you. If you're struggling with one of these areas, if you can close your eyes, bow your head up. Close your eyes. Bow your heads as we get ready to pray and close this out. If you're struggling with one of these three areas, whether it's, you know, it's capturing, it's writing it down, maybe it's just simply waiting for it. Maybe there's some pride that's gone unchecked in your heart. I just want to give you a chance before God to get that right, to learn where he's giving you vision. Maybe right now you're saying that, I don't even know that I have a vision. I believe that today God can give you, he can speak to you. If you will take a moment to listen for his voice. So with every head bowed and eye closed, I'm just going to go through these different parts of today. And if you've got something that you feel like God is stirring up in your heart, you haven't written it down yet, but you know that there's something there and you're struggling to take the time to write it down, if that's you, would you slip up your hand and say, God, help me to write down what you're giving me. Help me to clarify what you're saying. Yep, I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. For the second group of people, you believe God's giving you some vision. You've got something that's going. He's directing you, but you're struggling in the waiting game. You're struggling to be faithful even when you don't see the results that you're hoping for and expecting for, and you need help to continue and be faithful. If that's you, would you slip up your hand? Yep, I see that by a lot of hands. A lot of hands, yeah. Thank you, put your hands down. And one more. This is a tough one. I'll let you know my hand's gonna be raised up too with this. You're struggling with some pride. You're struggling with a root of this is because of me and not you. I want the glory. I want the praise. And you need to root out some pride in your life. If that's you, would you slip up your hand? Say, God, help me to bring down my pride, lower my pride, and increase my humility. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being honest. I appreciate that. You can put your hands down. Let's pray together, church. God, I thank you that you love us so much. Each and every individual here you love and you have a plan for their life. And I ask for those that you, you've been stirring their hearts 
you've been, you've been moving on them, you've been speaking to them, I pray that they would be able to write down what you're giving them to make it very clear so that they can run with this vision that you've given them for their lives, for their goals, whatever it is for the future. God, your plan and your vision is my future. Your vision is my future, not my vision. That we defer to you. Help us to write it down. I pray for those that are in the waiting right now, and it's difficult, and it's hard, and it's frustrating. God, give us the endurance. Give us the faith, because the righteous shall live by faith. That even when we don't see results, that we continue to work hard to press on. To leave what's behind and press on towards the goal. And God, I pray for those of us, many of us, I'm sure, that we're struggling with pride. God, help us to remember that it is all because of you. It is your goodness in our life that has nothing to do with my striving. We simply are living our life in response to your goodness. Strip us of our pride. We've not earned anything. We've not earned salvation. It is by your grace and by your gift. And so we thank you for that today. Help us to live in humility, <coughs> trusting in you before trusting in myself. And I pray a blessing on this church as we leave today, that we leave feeling empowered and equipped and blessed and prepared for all that you have for us, for your vision and for your hope. We thank you for today. We bless your name as we leave. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. If you receive that today, will you give him praise before we end today? If you believe God is working, he's moving, give him praise, God. We thank you for today. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here today. I hope you had a great time at church, and I hope to see you again next week. God bless you guys.